Information theory. And so today we're going to get into the heart of the matter with this uh, 4D to D correspondence. Um, so given a 4D superconformal field theory with n equal to 2 supersymmetry, we define a map chi onto the space of vertex operator algebras. So first let me describe uh, this map in, uh, uh, quali at the qualitative level. So this theory clearly lives in R4, and we are going to choose a plane in R4, which we uh, parameterize by coordinates uh, z and z bar, uh, whereas, of course, we have a um, transverse plane, which uh, will be parameterized by coordinates w and w bar, for example. And uh, the main statement, which I'm going to justify and um, at least sketch the derivation of the claim, is that a suitable set of uh, local operators inserted on this um, plane. A priori, of course, this would be a function of um, um, all positions, both um, having a, a dependence on z and z bar, but uh, for suitably chosen Uh, operators, this is in fact just a meromorphic function. Okay, so, um, and uh, the operator product expansion of the four dimensional theory will then descend to a purely meromorphic operator product expansion defined on this plane, uh, and then. Uh, this is just a matter of language, but this will be interpreted as the correlation function of a 2D chiral CFT, or uh, uh, in mathematical parlance, a vertex operator algebra. So that's the main claim. Yes? Um, so are you worried about um, Weidman axioms and operator, operator value distributions and all of that jazz, or, or are you worried about something else? Okay, that will not be the case. And um, so, I'm sorry, uh, there's a, the question was whether the restriction of uh, the operator to the plane um, could perhaps be too singular or there could be any pathologies, and the answer is no. I mean, this is, of course, something you can do. You have uh, a correlation function which, uh, where the positions of the operators are a priori uh, anywhere in R4, and it is just your choice, if so hard so desires to put all these insertions on the same plane. Nobody can ever stop you from doing that. Now, in a conformal field theory, of course, what the correlation function just depend, will depend on is conformal cross ratios. So up to four points, in fact, there is absolutely no loss of generality in taking the operators on the plane, because by a conformal transformation, you can always put them on a plane. But from five points onwards, this is a true restriction. You're just choosing to study correlators of operator inserting on, on a plane. Uh, but of course, generically, for arbitrary choice of insertions, this is, of course, um, going to be not a meromorphic function. And the assertion I'm making is that for special choice of uh, operators, it will be meromorphic. And I'm going to go uh, through this in some detail, but uh, the way this will work is um, by a variation of a rather familiar trick in supersymmetry. 
uh, which is we will choose these operators, these special operators, are selected by the principle of being cohomology elements or representative elements of some fermionic operator that I'm going to call square Q that obeys square Q equal to zero. And, and so these operators will be, uh, again, they will be annihilated. And they are, they, are really, they, are really, they really should be understood as cohomology classes. So we identify operators that differ by exact terms. And uh, the statement is that uh, the derivative in the anti-holomorphic direction z bar turn out to be q exact. And so by the usual type of argument, uh, this means that if you translate an operator in the z bar direction, uh, that doesn't matter because you will pick up something which is q exact and then by integrating by parts, given that all the operators are Q-close, the correlation function will be independent of the Z-bar translation. You may be familiar with uh, a version of this argument in n equal one supersymmetry, uh, which is the tail of the chiral ring. So you will re recall that if you choose um, operators which are in the cohomology of one full-fledged Poincaré supercharge in n equal one, the correlation function, those of it are completely independent of positions in the full space because in that case, all translations are exact. In this case, uh, the Z-bar translation is exact and so we get something richer than the chiral ring. We get something that depends uh, meromorphically on the coordinates and, and that is, of course, a richer structure. Okay, that's the basic idea. Now, um, the only slightly uh, unusual features of these operators is, th is that the familiar operators, composite operators of, um, of conformal field theory, we saw example yesterday, you know, things like trace phi square, q, q tilde, et cetera. Um, when we compute correlation function of these gadgets, we just translate them everywhere in R4 and compute the correlator. Here we're going to do something slightly, uh, slightly exotic in the sense that we will um, introduce an additional position dependent of the operator as follows. So it will turn out that the operators that uh, will be relevant for this purpose uh, carry a representation of SU2R So remember that i's are the uh, SU2R indices, and so here I'm looking at a uh, spin k over two representation. So these are uh, symmetrized uh, fundamental indices of SU2. So just to be very concrete, this would be a doublet. This would be triplet, et cetera. And so what we will do, we will take ordinary composite operator that transform in some finite dimensional representation of SU2R and contract them with some explicit uh, Z-bar dependence. where this uh, u is a doublet um, of SU2 that uh, is just one z bar. Okay, so, well, I mean, hopefully this is clear. So if I, um, 
expand this out, this would be O1111, that's the highest weight of the SU2 representation, plus Z bar O211 plus Z bar squared O221 dot 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 Z bar to the K O222222. Okay? So every time you lower one uh, SU2 index from the highest weight to the lowest weight of the doublet, you pick up a power of Z bar. Okay, so the operators that obey these meromorphicity properties are the operators which are dressed in this way by this additional coordinate dependence. But of course, if you expand them out, you're gonna get just a large sum of terms, each of which is a perfectly legitimate and standard canonical correlation function of your original theory. Okay, is the claim clear? I haven't proved anything, but I've just asserted what is true. Okay, and so it turns out that this, for suitable choice, for suitable choice of this sort of seed operator O1111, which is the highest weight of SU2R, if I carefully pick this one, and I will have to pick it as living in some suitably shortened representation of the full superconformal algebra, then it turns out that this operator is, this resulting operator will be Q closed, and, um, and then the claim will follow. Okay, so let's um, get to work a little. So, um, so what is this Q? Q is, um, is a certain linear combination of the fermionic generator of the superconformal algebra, which in our conventions is um, this choice. Um, now, you can make different choices that are related by conjugation. So the indices here are not terribly important, except that once you have decided uh, the indices of the Poincaré Q, the indices of the conformal Q are uniquely fixed by the principle that this object has the property that I want. And different choices of indices, which are again are related by conjugation, are related something you could have asked, well, what decides which particular plane of our four I'm picking? Well, that's totally arbitrary. With this particular choice of Q that selects a particular plane, if I make a different choice, that amounts to rotating the plane, but all configurations are, of course, equivalent by, because they're related by conjugation. Now, um, we can look at the dagger operator, which uh, remember that the Q and S are dual to each other, so this would be the S1 minus plus Q tilde two minus dot, and compute the anti-commutator. A one one finds uh, is, um, um, this combination of quantum numbers. So remember, this is also what is sometimes called delta. This is the scaling dimension. This is the Cartan of the non-abelian piece of the art symmetry. And J1 plus J2 are the Cartans of the SU21 times SU2 Lorentz. In fact, you can also think of this J1 plus J2 as the angular momentum in the plane, in the preferred plane that I chose where my VOA lives. Okay, L is just the angular momentum on the plane. And, uh, and the other combination would be the angular momentum in the transverse plane.
Okay. Now this object is actually greater or equal than zero from unitarity. And when uh, it is zero, then um, this is the argument that I quickly review. Yes, then we are talking about an operator that lives in a special shortened representation of the superconformal algebra. And so operators that precisely saturate this bound are um, generalized. So yesterday I gave you a very uh, quick introduction to superconformal representation theory, and you will recall that I had uh, single out three classes uh, of multiplets. Uh, this one obeys E is equal to 2R. This one obeys, both to be taken together, they obey E equal the absolute value of R, and this one is something like uh, E equal, uh, well, this particular one is just E is equal to 2. So, um, so this condition uh, clearly generalizes this one. Okay? If I take a scalar operator, uh, I am in this class, but more generally, I'm uh, generalizing this condition. Now, um, there's an important uh, point I need to emphasize. Um, when I was uh, labeling representations yesterday, I was labeling them by the quantum numbers of the highest weight of the full superconformal representation. Whereas here, I'm not necessarily doing that. I'm just looking at the quantum number of a, of a state that need not be the superconformal primary. And so I have to be a little bit more careful. Why it is clear that these representations contain operator of this kind, because I just look at the highest weight and I immediately see by inspection that this condition is obeyed, it could be that as I, as I build my representation acting with Qs, I could find somewhere uh, not on the highest way state, but somewhere above. Oh. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, um, let me uh, perhaps go here. OK, so I'm making. Um, the statement that it could be that some of the um, other representation was considered yes, or perhaps some even more general representations contain um, uh, such an operator, but not as a highest weight state. So you really need to do a more careful analysis and uh, search for where such, such states appear. And, and so the complete list turns out to be that they, these operators that obey this condition, so let's give them a name. So operators that obey this condition are called sure operators for historical reasons. And actually, four-dimensional unitarity implies a second condition that is a little bit less obvious, but it's true, that the transverse spin is equal to little r. That comes for free by the conditions of four-dimensional unitarity. And so out of the five quantum numbers that a generic operator is labeled with the energy, the two spins, big r and little r, you have um, two linear relations. So the generic operator uh, in this class would be labeled by three quantum numbers. So the generic sure operator will be labeled by, for example, E, R, and um, uh, little r. Such an operator, one easily shows, is necessarily a highest weight of SU2R. And so necessarily the index structure is the one where the SU2R indices are all in the highest weight representation. OK? So let me conclude this line of thought, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the uh, enumeration of all possible such operators. 
by the usual cohomological arguments, if I want to compute the cohomology of Q, it better be that the cohomology of Q, uh, the, all the cohomology elements must obey this condition. Because otherwise, if they don't, I can use Q dagger to invert, and I find that the operator, if it's killed by Q, is also Q exact. And so the cohomology of Q is really identified, after a little bit of further analysis, with precisely the set of operators that obey this condition. So sure operators at the origin of my plane are in cohomology. But it turns out that as I translate them in the plane, uh, I need to be a little bit more careful because transla generic translations in the plane do not commute with Q. So this object at the origin, if it's a sure operator, is in cohomology of this square Q. But um, the translated operator is not necessarily. And the reason for it is that the, um, that while uh, the Z momentum commutes with Q, the Z bar momentum does not. And so if you want to insist that you have something which is annihilated by Q, you need to perform this funny dressing that I had, that I have just deleted. You take the, the sure operator, which is the one in the highest weight of SU2R, and then you lower its SU2 indices in a way that contains this additional um, um, Z bar dependence, and now this operator is Q closed, and then the cohomology class of this operator by the argument, so, and so this operator does not come, uh, sorry, um, right. Um, by the argument I gave earlier, the cohomology representative of this operator defines some operator, um, how should I call it? Uh, I, should, I could call it, um, what is a good name? Little a of O, which is purely meromorphic. Okay, is the structure of the argument clear? Now, So, so to recap, given a 4D superconformal field theory, n equal to 2, T, we have this VOA uh, map to the VOA, so there's chi that maps the theory T into some VOA. And the space of states, which you will recall are the same thing as local operators at the point of the VOA, are identified with the space of sure operators of the 4D theory. You have to play this funny game of uh, which you call twisted translation, but you know, given a sure operator, you can find a twisted translated operator. So the space of the the space of the, the for each sure operator, you're going to find a two-dimensional gadget. So each sure operator will give rise to a to a uh, to a meromorphic to a meromorphic field in two dimensions. OK, so I'm going to do a little bit of uh, representation theory, but not too much. And then, given that this might say, sound a little bit abstract, we'll, do, we'll illustrate how this happens in free field theory, which will hopefully convince it's true, and then take it from there. 
So, so again, so we had this condition. Um, sorry. Um, and uh, where do I find operators that obey these quantum numbers? Well, the highest weights of B hat R multiplied obey this condition, so they are good. It turns out that there are additional multiplets that I didn't quite have time to discuss because there's too many multiplets and too, too little time, which generalize the stress sensor multiple. The stress sensor multiple, you recall, his takes of this form but with r equal to zero. And so there are generalizations of the sure multiple where this is true. And that you will find a sure operator in at level two, acting with QQ tilde on the highest weight of this guy will give you a sure operator with um, okay, obeying this kind of condition with um, where, where, however, the R that is um, there is, uh, is a little shifted from the R of the sure operator. So let me put an R prime here. And then, there are additional sure operators in some other type of multiples which are called D and D bar. I don't want to uh, belabor the story too much uh, because it gets complicated. Uh, and this operator will have uh, a non, this will be at a level, a level one on the highest weight. And this operator will have uh, U1R different from zero. So for the purpose of, um, not confusing you with too many representations. In the rest of this lecture, I will try to focus on vertex operator algebras where all uh, the states have little r equal to zero. So that we need to all worry only about two quantum numbers, the total energy and the spin, which um, given this relation, that will also fix the value of big R. Okay, so yes. Uh, no. The short answer is no. Yes. Yeah, after, after you, you go through this map, so you take the four-dimensional operator, you do this funny, uh, you take this funny linear combinations, and then this, dif this uh, well, and then up to exact terms that don't matter in a correlation function where all operators are of this type, this defines a, this defines a as I wrote here, a purely meromorphic object in two dimensions. No, but in conformal field theory, uh, in two dimensional conformal field theory, it's true that the, that we have at least the conformal symmetry, but nobody can uh, stop you from having additional quantum numbers if, if you want. So from the point of view of, um, from the point of view of the two dimensions, okay, so uh, any, uh, thanks for the question. So for example, this little r quantum number, it is some additional quantum number that this two dimensional operator carry, but it is allows non-locally, so there is no uh, a fine symmetry related to this little r. This turns out to be some sort of some outer uh, automorphism symmetry of the theory. It's not related to a, it's not a, a local symmetry. And, um, okay. Okay, so, um, okay, so, you see what this is saying, in the, in the, in the world of BPSness, one is often used to consider um, relations of this type, where the energy is equal to some charge. Uh, it is li a little, slightly more involved to also consider operator that carries spin. And this is the universe of sure operators. So it is some generalization of the operators of this type, but that also carry spin. And that is, of course, necessary if I ever want to get holomorphic Z dependence, because taking Z derivatives adds quantum number, so it better be that 
I have a holomorphic angular momentum as part of my shortening condition. Um, so perhaps some of you were not at the discussion section yesterday. I uh, explain in some detail the physical meaning of these operators. I explained that the vacuum expectation value of this operator is what parameterizes the Higgs branch of vacua of the theory. I also explained that, what, uh, that the other B, uh, half BPS operator I had, the epsilon R operators, parameterize the Coulomb branch of vacua, but these operators do not participate in my cohomology. Okay, so the vertex operator algebra I'm constructing is some huge subtab version of the chiral ring on the Higgs branch. The chiral ring on the Higgs branch will obey this condition, and now we are relaxing it to also consider some more exotic, semi-short representation that also have spin. But there is some moral sense in which what we are, we are doing is Higgs branch physics. In particular, the Higgs branch physics is fully captured by this VOA. And the Coulomb branch, at least naively, is not at all part of the story. OK? Now, here, as a special case of this kind of multiplets, there is a case R equal to 0, which, as I explained yesterday, is the stress energy tensor multiplet. So let's look at that in slightly more detail. So. This operator, the highest weight of this operator is equal to 2 and r equal to 0, and it's some operator x. But as I was explaining yesterday, you go to level 1, and you will find some good things, such as the SU2 r current, the U1 r current, and then eventually you get to level. So this is QQ tilde, and then when you get to Q square, Q tilde square, you will find the stress tensor. And the sure operator in this multiple happens to be the highest weight of SU2R of the um, SU2R nether current with indices plus plus dot. This is sure. You can check it because it has E equal to 3 being a current. It has R equal to 1 being the highest weight of a triplet. And it has L equal uh, to um, 1 so that the sure condition is obeyed. Okay. So, um, so let's look at um, this, uh, the cohomology class defined by this operator, which again, if I want to be super explicit, it would be this. This operator defines a uh, meromorphic object in uh, two dimensions. And OK, another important relation that I haven't uh, written down, and I really should have, is uh, what is the holomorphic scaling dimension of this cohomology class. And that relation is, this is the L0 eigenvalue, the purely meromorphic dimension. That is big R plus L. And so this operator defines an object with holomorphic dimension 2. And well, there's a famous object with holomorphic dimension 2. It's called the stress energy tensor. And um, it's not obvious, but it's true that if I do a detailed analysis of the consequences of four-dimensional superconformal word identities obeyed by the art symmetry current, which we know very well, you get to deduce that this T is not just a holomorphic object of dimension 2, but it obeys the operator product expansion expected from a two-dimensional stress tensor. And so we really declare that this is the stress tensor. So you see. 
the way this is happening is kind of curious. The two distress sensor, in some moral sense, comes from the four distress sensor, but not quite directly. It's not directly coming from T, it's coming from a super partner of T, which is predicted to exist because of superconformal symmetry. And so the statement that the four dimensional theory has a local stress tensor, I re reviewed this as, yes, that there is a, uh, there is a local stress tensor with associated uh, central charges. This predicts the existence of a local stress sensor T of Z in my VOA. And you can compute, again, using the details of this map and superconformal word identities, the two-dimensional central charge is minus 12 times the C anomaly coefficient. Okay, this is a nice surprise. Because up to now, this construction could have looked a little bit artificial. I'm slicing the four dimensional space, taking this funny plane. Of course, by construction, given that I'm embedding this plane in a four dimensional conformal field theory, conformal transformation that preserve the plane, which is just the usual SL2 times SL2 bar, are guaranteed to be present, of course. It's just a subset is a subalgebra of the full uh, conformal algebra. But what was not at all guaranteed to happen is that the SL2, uh, the local SL2 generators, which are L minus 1, L0, L1, in fact enhance to the full Virasoro symmetry. This will be negative because, uh, because the four dimensional um, central charge is defined from a two-point function of the stress tensor, and so four-dimensional unitarity uh, imposes that C for D will be positive, and so necessarily the, the two-dimensional theory is, has negative center charges, and in particular is non-unitary. And so we, we are going to get non-unitary vertex operator algebras, which, however, are far from generic because the details of the map from 4 to 2D uh, although unitarity is broken, um, four-dimensional unitarity is still hidden some, somehow. You know, here, in some sense, is the first indication of it. Well, C is not generic, it's negative. And, uh, and the story will, will, will become uh, important uh, later. So... Um, we can play the same game with, um, so the other thing that I explained yesterday in the discussion section, and that B hat one is the uh, multiplet that contains, if you go to level two, with Q, Q tilde, you will find the, um, uh, is conserve uh, current, which is the flavor current. We interpret this as the flavor conserved current. Okay, so necessarily this object must live in the adjoint of some group GF that commutes with the superconformal algebra. And so if it, if it is the case that the four-dimensional theory enjoys some continuous global symmetry, then it must have a conserved current. And yesterday I also went into some detail explaining how necessarily at the generic point of the conformal manifold that uh, conserved current must in fact belong to a B at one multiplet. So I'm going to run an argument similar to what I ran for the stress tensor. I have a stress tensor to proximity predicts the existence of an R current. The R current is a sure operator. Here is the same story. I have a conserved current to proximity predicts that it belongs to a B hat one multiplet, but the highest weight of the B hat one multiplet is a sure operator because it obeys this condition. So B hat one highest weight is this object mu ij, and so mu one one is sure. 
And so this will give rise to a holomorphic object. So this object, mu and one, has r equal to one and l equal to zero. It gives rise to a holomorphic object with holomorphic weight one, which we are going to identify with an affine Katz-Moody current for the symmetry GF. Okay, so the similar phenomenon happens here. You have a global symmetry in four dimension that becomes local in the two-dimensional chiral algebra. Again, you can use word identities to convince yourself that this is truly a, uh, a fine current that obeys the correct OP. And, uh, and then what I need to tell you is the level of the two-dimensional Katzmudi algebra, which again, there's an interesting minus sign, is related to the level of the Ford current, which I defined in my previous lectures. Okay, so these are two very universal features of this correspondence, that the global conformal symmetry becomes local and the global uh, flavored symmetry becomes local in this two-dimensional vertex operator algebra with a precise correspondence between the central charges and the levels. Okay. Okay, let me um, comment of an, on an important point. So, as I said, we start with, let me do it slowly. So, the generic Hilbert space of the 4D theory is quintuply graded because it depends on these five quantum numbers and then possibly, in fact, there could be additional frame of quantum numbers that I'm ignoring for now. And then the sure condition imposes these two relations. The second one is the consequence of the first using for the unitarity. And so the space of sure operators has this, uh, I could decide to label them just by E, um, uh, what should I choose? E, uh, little r, big R, and um, little r, or um, by using this other relation that, let me write this here, uh, I could also, uh, so the, the v, this vector space of the chiral algebra, now this is a 2D statement, will then have a gradient by little h, by big R, and by little r. There are three quantum numbers, just by taking linear combinations. Okay, so um, little h is obvious, it's just a scaling dimension. Little r is less obvious, and I'm going to ignore it in the rest of the talk. And big R is also not at all obvious. But it's predicted to be a uh, quantum number that must be hidden if I exactly know the map. Uh, however, there is a major distinction between how these quantum numbers behave under the operator product expansion. Whereas little h, and in fact also little r, are preserved by the operator product expansion, Big R is violated. Well, why is that? Well, it's obvious. Because I took this funny linear combination of objects which had different big R quantum numbers, and so the big R quantum number is not preserved by the operator product expansion of the vertex operator algebra. But nevertheless, if I really fully know the details of the map, I can unambiguously assign this quantum number to the uh, operators of the VOA. Okay, so, uh, so this is a subtle point, but it's essential in, in more recent developments. Under the operator product expansion, you, you see the, the way this correspondence works 
it, it, I start with the highest possible values of R, which is my sure operator, and then I decrease it by z bar dependence, and then I do OPEs. And so what you actually learn is that although big R is not preserved by the OP, um, it can at most decrease. Big R can never increase in the operator product expansion of the VOA. It can at most decrease. And so this defines, in, in fancy parlance, a filtration of my, of my space. The filtration is what is preserved by the OP, but secretly there is a true way to define an actual grading if I really know the details of the map. I'm insisting on this because um, what we will uh, often do is to use very general properties of the Ford theory to just guess the VOA. And the guess is correct, but the guess does not come equipped with the details of the map. So the guess will automatically know about little h, but the dependence on, on big R will be, in fact, a bit hidden. And, and so that's additional information that you only know if you know the full details of the 4D to, to, to the map. Why is that important? It's important because knowledge of this big R is what determines the sign in the two-dimensional inner product. So the four-dimensional theory is unitary, so norms are positive. The two-dimensional theory is not unitary, but there's a very precise sign that I can predict in the norms, which is correlated with the hidden value of little r. And so for very simple operators, I know the sign. For example, by detailed construction, there are these two very universal operators, the stress tensor and the affine current. And there, I know exactly the sign. It has to be negative. But as I start taking normal order product of holomorphic derivative of T and J, for example, or the more complicated operator I may have, uh, the big R doesn't add up. I have to very carefully take special linear combination of this operator that uh, depend on the details of the 4D to D map to predict the, the value of big R. And once I know that, I can predict the precise signs that must appear in the inner products. So knowing the full details of the map amount to having some version of funny unitarity of the 2D theory, which is not the standard unitarity because it, uh, there is this R quantum number that predicts what signs I should get. Okay, so I'll, come, I'll hopefully come back to this point later on. Questions about this? Okay, so now to make, yes. I can, I can have an act, so I kind of can, in the sense that I, if I'm a mathematician, I can just postulate that the VOA had this additional R grading and then tell you what the norm should be. That I can always do, but it's not very useful. Because if I give you a VOA presented abstractly, as say I give you the, the set of generators and the operator product expansion, a priori there could be multiple ways or perhaps even no way to assign this R grading. And, and so the full structure is, in other terms, there's additional structure on the VOA that, that uh, is not something that is standard. So yes, I can just say that what I'm really interested in are VOAs that have this additional structure, but if, if I don't give it to you from the beginning, then you have to struggle a bit to either find, find it and show that it's unique or know some additional information to uh, identify it. Okay, I can be precise if you really insist. So the additional structure is the VOA must admit a involution, well, it's not really an involution, a linear map sigma, which is actually um, not an, okay, first of all, the first statement is that the VOA 
amidst this grading, this triple grading. In terms of that grading, sigma square is minus one to the two r, so it's, it's only an involution for operators with, uh, it, it only squares to the identity only for operator with integer r, which for simplicity we could consider to be the case. And then um, if I work in a basis uh, with definite values of r, the, uh, I have the following statement that the two-point function of a and of sigma of a uh, times z to the 2h, this is just a number, um, times, crucially, minus 1 to the h minus r is positive. That is the additional structure that I have. Actually, I should perhaps say strictly positive for non-zero a. If I find zero, it means that I should set that this is true. It means that I really, that a is an alt state I should model by it. So that is the additional structure. But it's not standard. So if I give you, sorry? Say it again. In the sense of? Okay, we, can, we should talk about it. You probably know more about it than me. But it's, it's not a, um, if I give you something as trivial as the Virasoro algebra, what is this R grading? You don't know, okay? And so that is something that uh, you only know if you have carefully tracked this, uh, this map from 4 to the for d to 2d. But this is the additional structure that you, could, that you can axiomatize. Okay, so some uh, trivial free field theory example. Let's do the free hyper to demystify this whole story. The free hyper, you will recall, there is this, this is not curly Q not to be confused with the supercharge, is uncurly Q. And so the sure operator here is just Q1, which has R equal one half and H and E equal to um, one. I can also define the tilde version of this, which is Q tilde minus Q star. And so here I have Q tilde 1 equal to Q tilde, which has the same quantum numbers. And of course, the 4D non-trivial OP would tell me that Q of ZZ bar with Q star of WW bar, well, let's call it, let's do this at zero for simplicity. This is just, of course, this operator is dimension one, and so this is uh, z times z bar, okay? And similarly, similarly, uh, q tilde z z bar with q tilde star. Okay, but now we construct the twisted translated operator and um, compute uh, two point function with the twisted translated operator of tilde type. Okay, well, I mean, this is kind of boring, but z this, piece is, this piece is clearly zero because I am at the origin, z bar is equal to zero. 
And then, uh, okay, so this is a trivial exercise. We see that this is just Q. Contracted with Q tilde. Well, Q and Q tilde have non singular OP, so the only singular OP terms is here. And you see it's a triviality. But that's just what happens. Okay, I got a holomorphic correlatus for you, rather trivially, because this is bar dependence just cancelled out. Yes. Exactly. So what, what has been asked is that the, the OP of what you really need to compute is the OP of these twisted translated Schur operators. That contains a lot of junk, but that junk is, uh, is uh, decoupled in this correlation function by the cohomological argument that I gave. So what we're really saying, of course, is that within this subsector of operators, you have this enhanced infinite dimensional symmetry. But this is not a symmetry of the full four dimensional theory. It only holds uh, if you carefully choose the operators inside this subset. OK, so you see how meromorphic arises rather trivially in this free field example. And so the statement is that the free hypermultiplet gives rise to a pair Q, Q tilde of what are sometimes called symplectic bosons, which, are, which have, each of them has. It is like a beta gamma system, but with equal, you can think of this as a beta gamma system, but with equal conformal weight. It's a special case with equal conformal weight with the OPE Q of Z, Q tilde of W is one over Z minus W. This generalizes rather easily to the case where you have uh, multiple hypermultiple. In fact, I could in one shot do the case of the uh, half hypermultiple in some pseudo real representation R, and then here this would be pseudo real representation R uh, with the omega is the antisymmetric. Um, invariant of the representation. Okay? Now, free vector multiplets uh, work similarly, and there uh, you get uh, your sure operators from the gay genus. So, for the sure operator there is this gadget as it turns out. And this is uh, something that has r equal minus a half. So I promise not to talk about operator with non-zero little r, and I will not, but uh, for the free hyper, let me just make the statement that the, what the free hyper uh, will lead to, and then there's also lambda one plus lambda. This lambda and lambda tilde will translate into a BC ghost system of dimension one zero, but where the zero mode of C has been removed. This is the small algebra of the BC system. So what really happens is that uh, lambda gives you B and, uh, and lambda tilde gives you delta C and now, uh, well, again. These are fermionic objects, but again, it's, so the central charge here of this BC ghost system is minus two. And you can check that that agrees with my, with my general formula, the C2D is minus 12 times C4D. And for, for the free hyper, uh, you get Q, Q tilde, whose central charge is minus 1. Again, agreeing with the statement that the free hyper multiple has C anomaly coefficient equal to 1 over 12, 12 in four dimensions. Okay, so free theories, not very surprisingly, give rise to free vertex operator algebras. 
but of course, um, as I emphasized yesterday, we, we have ways to always um, insist that we are talking about non-free theories, uh, and that's what we are going to do, and then the story is going to become much more interesting. It's probably a good time to stop. Thank you.